Today we get to finish out this series that we've been in for a few months on Unleashing Grace. Next Sunday is December 1st. Guess the new series. Anyway, so anyway, that's... But we get to finish it out. And um, let me just say this. We may be finishing a series called Unleashing Grace, but we don't finish the message of it. I want you to, to really know that. It's absolutely, totally, and utterly significant that we should always know that our existence is to be unleashing grace. All too often, we identify as being God's messengers. We're not his messengers. We are the message. Because we're the body of Christ. We're his hands and his feet. We're not just his messengers. We are the message moving forward. And, and we've committed over these recent weeks to say, hey, are we prepared to do whatever it takes to unleash the grace of God in Tempe and beyond? This whole series, we started out by this phrase from Hebrews 12, 15, this verse. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. No one misses the grace of God. And we're called Grace Community Church and our whole purpose and the mission of the church, Big C Church, is quite it's a five-fold purpose that's there. That's, is, it's really revealed through the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then revealed through the great commission that Jesus gave after his resurrection, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always to the end of the age. And we've spent weeks on this. Please go back online. All the messages are there. In all these things, we've been walking through what it is to grow and reach and adore and to connect and engage. Go and engage in them. And, and, and I watched on Tuesday, um, Jonathan shared the message with you last week about compassion and some of his personal experiences and encounters. And it was awesome. And I'm watching it on Tuesday. I'm thinking, oh, wow. Like, wow. But what does it mean to love your enemies? What does it mean to be compassionate? When we say we want to be unleashing grace, that by default should put us into new territory, uncomfortable environments. Two weeks ago, I talked about um, generosity in unleashing generosity. And I, I talked about this 3D of, of giving and being generous. And I want to remind you of some of that uh, with a real purpose. Those who are here, you all got these highly expensive 3D glasses. And if you weren't here and you've heard the message, you can contact me. I have some more of these left over. But I want to remind you of this. Generosity has these three dimensions to it. First of all, we are to be spontaneous at times. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. What does it look like to just be spontaneous and, and generous? Not just with your money, with your possessions, with your time, with your ideas, just to be spontaneous because we are spontaneous to be a blessing. Spontaneous blesses. How's that been going? Secondly, strategic giving is to build. We're strategic and we plan and we give what is first to God. Tithing isn't just a percentage, it's a priority. What is first to God. But when you strategically give, you know you are being constructive. So strategic is to build, spontaneous to bless, strategic to build, and thirdly, sacrificially. And sacrificial giving leads to breakthrough. I just want to remind you, how's that going? This Wednesday night at our Thanksgiving Eve service, it'll be super great. We're going to focus on the goodness of God. It's going to be so, so good. But we're going to have an opportunity to, to give on Wednesday night. And maybe for some of you, it'll be spontaneous. Maybe for some of you, it'll be spontaneous and strategic. Or maybe even sacrificial. Whichever one you need to just unlock... I want to give you that opportunity that Wednesday presents itself with that. I want to bring an offering just as an, an overflow. This isn't part of your regular weekly giving. This is just an, an, a thing we get to do to unlock. And I want to remind you of that for Wednesday. Anyway, today, let's dive in. If you brought a Bible with you or you've got it on your phone, your Bible app, Ephesians. Turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. The Bible is made up of two main components, an Old Covenant and a New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament. And this is in the New Testament. It's like the last 25% of the printed Bible, and it starts Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then there's the early church formation, the book of Acts, and then you get these letters. 
It's written to these new churches all across the Mediterranean basin. Then you have the book of Romans, and so you've got Romans, and then you get First and Second Corinthians, and then slowly hit the breaks, you get this Galatians and then Ephesians. If you see Philippians and Colossians, take a left. And you get Ephesians, and Ephesus was a, a city, and, and, and where is it today? Modern day Turkey. And Ephesus was at this point when the early church formed, was this city that was very, very actually experiential spiritually. They, they had all kinds of different experiential worship encounters, and one of the main things at that time was this priest, this goddess called Artemis, and it was a very sexually driven encounter of worship. And Artemis was known as the multi-breasted goddess. And she had priestesses and everything else. There was a lot of experiential stuff going on. And all kinds of, of lifestyles were prevalent at that time. And this church starts to form. And, and in the middle of that context, the Apostle Paul is navigating, hey, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus in your context, in your culture? But what are some of the things that you just need to know? And the book of Ephesians is just full of grace just all over. So we get to chapter 3. I'm going to dwell on verse 14 to 21 today. And to make full sense of it, you probably need to do some backstory reading yourself. We haven't got time today. Because verse 14 of chapter 3 of Ephesians starts with this. For this reason. For what reason? <laughs> Well, the previous words throughout that book so far are revealing that, but for this reason, very often, the grace of God, Ephesians 2, verse 8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not by what you can do, so you will boast. Talks into it that maybe you were once not a follower of God, but now if you've given your life to Jesus, you are no longer aliens, you are citizens, fellow citizens of of the kingdom of heaven. You've got a new identity. You belong and you've got a heavenly father. It's incredible. And he reveals all these truths. In fact, even in verse 10 of, that, of chapter three, he says, it was his intent, God's intent, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So here we go, verse 14. I'm going to go step by step through these verses today. He says this, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Pause already. Western culture appropriates kneeling with praying. It's not a wrong thing to do, but that wasn't this culture. In fact, Hebrew culture doesn't associate kneeling and praying. It associates standing with praying. Kneeling, quite clearly, and we'll probably get to it at the end of the service today if we have time, kneeling was really a posture of absolute devotion, and it was earnest. It was, I just have to fall to my knees in like, oh. Is deep encounter. And so when it comes to really deep worship, all you can do is fall to your knees because of, ah. Oh. I had a little moment this morning. It was about, I don't know, six o'clock this morning. I'm going through my notes. I'm seeing all this. I'm reading a psalm, which we may get to today, and playing on my phone. And I've got my earphones in, and I'm listening away. And um, hallelujah, salvation and glory the Kanye one, and I'm, and I'm listening to it, and, and I'm watching the, this YouTube video of them at their service, and, and I, I just had to get on my knees. I had it playing like nonstop on Friday. I was like, hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power, he is wonderful. There comes a point where you just got to, so for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Is your worship deep and earnest and oh, or is it just, yeah. From whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I'll remind you again, too many people who say I'm a follower of Jesus associate yourself as a sinner. You're not. 
If you've given your life to Jesus, you are no longer a sinner. You are a saint in the name of Jesus and a child of God who is engaged in the daily battle with sin. But your identity is not sinner, it is saint, it is no longer absent from God. You are adopted by the King of Kings and you are a child of God. And so for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So when you give your life to Christ, you are this adopted, you are a child of God and nothing can take you out of his hand. It's like, oh, I get it. And it continues. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. His riches? His glorious riches? What even is that? I don't know. Because whatever I describe it as is not going to be enough. So I'd rather just sit in the mystery of it and go, his glorious riches. Do you worship the king who has glorious riches? I'm not talking about money here. Way bigger things than that. Or is your view of God layered in he's not enough? He doesn't have enough. Glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The word power there is repeated three times in these few verses. Three times, hello. Three times the word power. And also three times the word love. I I think you need to connect with this. What power are you living in? And what power are you living with? We'll continue verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There is still an obedience, there's still a faith step, there's still a walking with God that is required of you. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, pause, rooted, planted. There comes a point where you can't expect things to change with like no intentionality. Do you know? Oh, you know, I just don't feel that close to God, but I just never pray and never engage in worship and don't read his word and I just, yeah, I just want it. I want the osmosis version rather than the intentional version. But he wants us to be rooted and established. And he's explaining all throughout his letter, rooted and established. That's why I shared with Sam and Amy, we want Asher to be planted in the house of the Lord that you would flourish. There is a planted and an established. There's sometimes a keeping going. There's a faithfulness. There's an obedience. There's a a discipline. It's not super cool all the time, but there is something so core about it. Keeping going, keeping going, keeping going. You know, I, I, I know for many of you, you know, you may have a, a physical side of your life you want to change. Well, that's going to take a discipline going in the same direction for a decent amount of time. Like one day eat well, every other day eat in ice cream and burger and fries. But every other day I'm doing good. I'm just telling you, the end of seven days, the results will show themselves. It's the way it is. I prefer the every other day style. But, but what about in your relationship? with people and what about your walk with God? There is a consistency, rooted and established. There's something about that, yes, rooted and established in love. And then he goes on to say this, that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp, and this is my main point today, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Why does it do this? What's with the wide and long and high and deep? Well, it's kind of a 360 days. I want to just spend a little brief moment on that in the context of wrapping up the series on unleashing grace. When we unleash it, we want to unleash it that it's so wide, we welcome everybody. So wide. We want to unleash grace that it's so long, you can't get to the end of it. That it's so high, 
people cannot but lift their gaze. And it's so deep, there is no deep, dark pit of despair that God cannot meet people in it. We need to understand that. So let me just say this, the wide thing. The wide. What's with the wide? Fling wide, all you heavens. We've been singing, fling wide the doors. Fling wide. How wide is the doorway of your household? How wide is the doorway of your friendship circle? How wide? Are you exclusive or are you open? How wide? Well, yeah, no, how wide? How wide do we want to unleash grace to? There's a moment you have to understand this. I can accept people without having to agree with them. Acceptance is not agreement. And so when we fling in wide this acceptance that anybody, everybody is welcome here at Grace Community Church. I don't save anybody. I don't bring anybody to a sense of conviction before the Lord. But I am responsible as you are to fling wide the doors. Don't forget, this is the Apostle Paul who authorized the execution of believers prior to encountering Jesus. Fling wide. How wide are we because the width of the love of Christ through his grace is way wider. And if you've narrowed it down, you think it's exclusive. You think it doesn't include certain people. You think, well, because, 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 because you think. They're they're not worthy of forgiveness. They've done too much. They're too far. Or even maybe you, you don't feel worthy of it. No, how wide is it? It's wider than you can imagine. How long? I love that phrase, how long, is because when you get to the end of yourself, it's still going longer. How long is the love of Christ? How long? I'll tell you how long, eternally long. Never ending. Never ending. So for some of you right now in a circumstance walking with Christ, you feel like you're about to quit. You feel like I just cannot go any further. The psalmist will be honest before God and go, Lord, how long must I wait? How long until you strike down these people? How long? It's okay to have that. But are you glad that there is no end to his love? goes longer. So if you feel like you're about to quit on something, maybe, maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's you're hopeless and I just don't see any hope anymore. I'm just letting you know the love of God is longer than that. Longer. Longer. Then he says how high, and I mentioned this. There is something good if you were to go to anybody and say, hey, have a look how high that is. How do you do that? You go Oh, that's how high that is. Nobody says how high and goes down. They go up. For some of you today, you have come in here with a stooping head. For whatever reason, things feel heavy, things feel difficult, and you're, it's just down. A mistake, a regret, words you wish you could take back. <laughs> whatever it may be, there is a, a down And today the Lord says, how high is my love? Have a look. Or try and have a look how high it is. Go on, just try. Just try and have a look. It's higher than you could possibly see and imagine. But what has it done? It's lifted your gaze. Lift your chin. Lift your gaze. Lift it. It's beyond that. It's higher than. Oh, yeah. There's a moment where you can just, all you can see is your own circumstances. Just lift your eyes. Lift them high. And then he says, how deep? And this is the beautiful one. No matter how deep the pit you are in right now, how dire the circumstances, how desperate you are craving a breakthrough, he is there. And his love can go underneath that. When you think he can't get any lower, he's right there. The psalmist even says, like I reached out to the Lord. He he heard my cry and he put my feet on a rock. But where was he? I was in the slimy pit. The depths of despair. And he came down. 
He stoops down. We have a phrase that love came down. That's that Christmas phrase. It's kingdom, heaven, down. It's there. And I want to create a moment today for you to encounter how deep his love is. How high it is. How long it is. How wide it is. Because that's what we are unleashing. We are unleashing grace, the love of God, and it's just got to be with that mindset beyond you. And then he goes into verse 20. So now to him who is able, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Really? Some of you have got imaginations. (laughs) But I'm just saying, do you believe that? To him who is able to do immeasurably more according to his power that is at work within us. Multiple scriptures on the, on the other side of power. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit says the Lord. There is, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. With what power are you living in? I know it's like obvious answer, but I'm asking that what power are you living in? Whose power that is dwelling in you? We should daily be being filled with the Holy Spirit because we leak. Be daily being filled with the Holy Spirit asking for that. Lord, I need to receive that. And so I was thinking this through and then just on Tuesday I I shared a devotion with the staff leaders and we gathered for staff meetings and I had something to share and it's something that had impacted me. Uh, You don't have to turn to it, you can write the reference down, Joshua 3, 5. Joshua 3, verse 5. Let me put this question to you. It's a Do you often or do you ever find yourself thinking, oh, in my life, I just want to do great things for God. I want to do great things for God. Maybe as a church we could say, okay, God, we want to do great things for you. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to say. It's just the wrong thing to say. (laughs) I think the heart of it could be a good heart. You know, oh, yeah, do you know what? I'm going to do great things for you, God. You just watch me go. I want to do great things. We want to do great things for you. And I understand that. But there is something that I think is going to help us unleash grace as we go forward. Joshua 3 verse 5. Context, God's people have been rescued out of Egypt. They now need to cross the Jordan River. There's a river there. They need to cross it on dry land. God does it. But anyway, here's a little point. Joshua 3 verse 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Stay with me. I just want to do great things for God. And God's like, really? How about consecrating yourselves because I want to do some amazing things through you. Not your great things for me, my amazing things through you. My amazing things. God wants to reveal himself through his people, through this church. So it isn't just, God, we are going to do great things for you. He's saying, I desire to do amazing things through you. My amazing things, which is immeasurably more than you could imagine. So what's the posture? The posture is consecrate yourselves. Surrender. Lay it down for you, God. My everything. My relationships. My career. My business my finance, my health, my purposes consecrated to you, God. I'm prepared to lay it all down. I lay it down for you because I want you to do amazing things through me for your glory, for your glory. And so it's not about we do great things for God. It's him desiring to do great things through you. His amazing things. So when he says he can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. 
everything we do as Grace Community Church should always be to unleash grace for his glory. Everything we do. We should run that as a filter with everything we do. How is this enabling us to unleash grace in Tempe and beyond? How is this encouraging us, equipping us to be unleashing grace? How is this enabling us, equipping us, inspiring us, and driving us to reveal how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? That's the posture. Consecrate yourselves. He is able. What is it that you're struggling to let go of? Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things things through you. The impossible. This is how, what we're going to do to close out this series right now. I want the musicians to come back up. I'm like, wow, you finished preaching already? Not really. <laughs> musicians come back up. Psalm 95. You don't have to turn to it. I'm going to read the first seven verses. We're going to, uh, in a moment, uh, ushers, you can get the communion elements. We'll bring them in a couple of minutes. I'll direct you when. But when it all comes down to this consecrate yourselves, if we want to be unleashing grace, all of that context, uh, we're going to be singing a, a new song to grace. And this song will be pretty thematic for Wednesday night. It's called The Goodness of God. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all small g gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, hello, <laughs> and the mountain peaks belong to him, hello. <laughs> the sea, how wide is that, <laughs> is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land, these deserts that are so wide and long. Come, wait for it. Let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Ushers, if you could just come down and serve the elements. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is open to you. Just go ahead and feel free, even if you're a guest with us and following Jesus, to go ahead and just take, take the symbols of bread and, and wine, that, that bread, this cup, it's not wine, it's juice, but take the symbols of that. I'm going to direct you when to take them today. So, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're still wrestling with the identity of God's reality or not, just feel free to let these elements pass you by. Just go ahead and take hold of those. And uh, I'm going to go through this song a couple of times. And, and I'll lead you in taking communion and also provide a moment for some of you to encounter just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That you may be filled to the fullness of God to go ahead and unleash grace in every way, in everything. And so... I want to stay up here. Um, I have this, I play this song like in the last month, probably every single day. And uh, it's beautiful, it's tender. And no matter what is going on in your life right now, you need to be reminded that in all my life, God has been faithful. And you, he's been faithful. In all your life, he has been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And there's a bridge in it that says, 
Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. The end of Psalm 23, it says, Surely goodness, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God's goodness, I love that. It's running after you. I do believe that God, for some of you today, is chasing you down. He's saying, stop it. Stop. Let go. I'm here. His goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after me. It's a beautiful song, and spend some time in it, and just keep all those elements for a minute, and I'll direct you when to take them. But just start singing it. Would you, Taylor, start going through this song? And